Thank you. I'm glad to be back. Um, and, you know, whenever I'm asked to speak to a group of educators, I become very self-conscious about my grammar and diction, and I have to make sure all my facts are correct and my del delivery is unbiased. So thank you all for keeping me on my toes. I think in the last few years, third and fourth generation Americans of Asian descent have been drawn into an unwanted and unexpected spotlight. New immigrants and non-English speakers have many more and different challenges. But those of us who were born in the US after World War II and our children as a group have been spared some of that spotlight. And when it comes to writing past, and uh, especially when it comes to, to writing past and persistent wrongs. But many of us have been actually taken aback uh, by not only the uptick in physical violence against Asians, especially older Asians, and those whom we have been brought up to respect and revere actually, um, but also by some truly hateful verbal assaults along with the baseline general ignorance about Asian history and our acculturation. So ambivalence, ambivalence within the community um, also serves to divide us. And without some common rungs for a ladder, we're dispersing our voice and resigning ourselves to that giant pool of other numbers too small for statistical reproducibility or generalization. These conclusions serve no one. I am a third generation American of Japanese descent uh, with a biracial daughter, a fourth generation um, woman who identifies as Asian, having lived in very much majority white suburban neighborhoods, schools, attended uh, white uh, suburban schools, um, church, um, sports, she was a swimmer, uh, and music, she played the piano and, uh, and drums. And I will tell you a little bit about myself because I think it somewhat aligns with what people in my generation have grown up with, including that crushing optimism and expectations of our parents, many of whom were incarcerated in the war relocation Department of Justice camps in the US mainland interior during World War II. Like of all other racial and ethnic groups, including the majority white population, the Japanese American population spans the whole economic, educational, artistic, athletic, etc. spectrum. But stereotypes still dominate when numbers are low and attention is cast to one or another feature. Just to put it out there, I'm definitely not one of those people who would thrive at MIT or Berkeley, nor am I particularly interested in or quote unquote good at math. I am, however, at five feet, four inches tall, bigger and more athletic than most Japanese American women my age. I did, however, um, go to non-Ivy League schools. I got a commission in the United States Navy and chose to serve in the military. I did get an MD degree and I became a surgeon, a cancer surgeon. Um, now I am uh, the chief medical officer for a big data analytics uh, firm, um, but I'm not a software, I'm not the software developer. I am much more interested in and have more aptitude for hands-on community-based solutions rather than IT or technology. So I have the, I did have the freedom to choose from any one of these uh, pathways to chart my own course, a luxury many of the early immigrants did not have and immigrants still do not have. There seems to be, there seems to have been a turning point during and after World War II where suddenly it was obvious that deep-seated xenophobia that had dominated the West was somehow misplaced and that laws needed to be enacted or changed to protect the rights of all US citizens and those for whom our government was accountable. So it helps a lot for students to be able to visualize a timeline of, of events, including the context in which the Chinese, Japanese and other Asian immigrants worked and lived largely but not exclusively in the West. And some of the attitudes still that, that still persist today should be recognized. It is even more crucial than ever to explore and understand some events from the past so that perhaps as adults, we can stop history from repeating itself again and again. So let's talk a little bit about the first Asian immigrants. They were actually Filipino escapees from Spanish slave ships who settled in the New Orleans areas area and developed a thriving fish fishing industry. They were part of the Southern culture. In fact, these Manila men 
And the first settlement was at St. Malo. The Manila men served in the U.S. Army under Andrew Jackson, believe it or not, and secured the victory against the British in the War of 1812. So many generations of Filipino Americans from these founders have remained in St. Bernard Parish and, and have also dispersed across the United States. And as you all know, many generations of Filipino Americans have proudly served in the U.S. Armed Forces. The early um, Asian Indian immigrants came largely from a single area. They came from the Punjab region of the subcontinent as early as 1790. And they were also Sikhs. And although they were from, they were also um, disparagingly called Hindus. And they found work in the railroads. They were, they too were laborers. So they found work in the railroads, the lumber industry, and others that were growing in Northern California and um, along the West Coast. They were seen as dirty, um, willing to sleep on the floor, work for low wages, and also did not require meat in their rations. So they were considered cheap labor, displacing, um, uh, preferred actually uh, because of that um, over their white counterparts. And then the early waves of Chinese and Japanese immigrants in the early 1800s were primarily also laborers. They worked in the sugarcane fields and there were some business people. The discovery of gold in California, as you all know, in 1948 triggered the arrival of miners as well from China. But California began to enact legislation that ended up taxing disproportionately these Chinese miners. They limit these, these laws also limited immigration and denied them protections that, was, that were afforded to the local uh, white population. In 18, by 1858, California had passed a law to exclude entry of Chinese and as they said, Mongolians and excluded Chinese children from attending the San Francisco public schools. Now, the first diplomatic mission to the United States from Japan arrived in 1860, right here at the Washington Navy Yard. So if you hadn't had a chance to see it, it's right there, right off the Metro. And, um, and while you're there, take the time to cross the, the street there and visit the Navy Museum. The, um, there is actually some great history in there in that they do have the replica of the, um, of the atomic bombs that um, were dropped um, on uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki later on in the history of our relationship with uh, Japan. So this diplomatic mission was also referred to as the first embassy of Japan. And there is actually a society in Japan of descendants of that first embassy. So they arrived on the USS Powhatan and which was commanded by Captain DuPont. They had no idea that the US would be in the throes of a civil war by the time they returned to Japan. So in 1862, California imposed a $2.50 monthly tax on every Chinese person. And by 1865, Chinese workers were recruited to complete the transcontinental railroad, including and especially the treacherous blasting through the Sierra Nevada mountains to unite the East and West in 1869. That same year, Japanese immigrants established the Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Colony. But by, not, by 1877, so not even 10 years later, anti-Chinese violence became much more widespread. Anti-Chinese labor unions, um, one of which was called the Knights of Labor, were created. And on July 23rd, 1877, unemployed white workers gathered for a meeting and began attacking Chinese immigrants, killing four of them, as they blamed them for their economic woes. A widely reported incident was known as the Trout Creek outrage and resulted in seven men being arrested and charged with murder and arson, but the jury found one defendant not guilty of murder after nine minutes of deliberation and all the rest of the charges were dismissed. This was the beginning of when we began to see the value of the lives of of um, people of Asian descent. And, um, and we will see this repeated with the, um, with the killing of uh, Vincent Chin in 1982. So if this sounds disturbingly, disturbingly familiar, it unfortunately is familiar. So the next year was 1878 and it was reaffirmed by law that only white and free people of African nativity could be naturalized and that Chinese people were not considered white, nor were the people from Japan, the Middle East and the Philippines and several other countries. Mexicans, incidentally, coming from the South and the, um, 
uh, Southwest uh, were considered white for the purposes of this law. So California had a second constitution that then tried to prevent municipalities and corporations from employing Chinese and allowing Chinese to live within the jurisdictional limits of um, all incorporated towns and cities. So that was also, um, you know, to, to segregate the neighborhoods. And, 18, and in 1880, in section 69 of California's civil code, issuing marriage licenses between whites and quote, Mongolians, Negroes, mulattoes, and persons of mixed blood was prohibited. And recall, my daughter is biracial. So this led up to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And, and this act was written, the way it was written, um, said to that um, in response to the violence against the Chinese, right? The, this led up to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 that suspended all immigration of Chinese laborers to the United States for 10 years. Now, this was later extended to 10 more years. So there was a time when Chinese laborers were, were excluded from immigrating or from coming to the United States to work um, by law. So perhaps the most chilling development, you know, I've been researching this for a long time. And um, I didn't automatically know any of this because, of course, none of it was taught in our history books. But the most chilling development I found in, in my years of research into the history of immigration from Asia to the United States was something more significant than local discriminatory practices or even the personal attacks on people of Chinese descent. What happened in 1905 was the formation and establishment of what's called the Asiatic, what well, became the Asiatic Exclusion League. Asiatic Exclusion League in San Francisco. Its origin was, being, was the Japanese and Korean Exclusion League, but later um, developed to include all people of Asian des descent, including the Chinese and Asian Indians. And why? Well, these were labor leaders. They were local um, you know, politicians, law enforcement officers, community leaders, many unemployed white people who were advocating for quote, white man's country and the prohibition of Asian labor immigration. This movement extended up and down the West Coast and into Canada as well as an organized effort to exclude anyone of Asian descent from employment. So once that league was started, they immediately began working to prevent any increase in Asians along the West coastline. The league used strong arm methods, violence against Asians to try to ensure the rigorous enforcement of the Chinese Exclusion Act, including fining people who didn't um, exclude, um, it didn't follow the act, right? Or didn't follow the law and expanded its provisions to all other immigrants of Asian descent. So their collective aim was to spread false anti-Asian misinformation and to support and aggressively lobby for legislation to restrict immigration and the rights of Asians who have immigrated, had immigrated to the West Coast, All right? So if that doesn't sound disturbingly familiar, right? What does? In um, response to their efforts, right? So this is a labor union, I uh, know union, a, a labor organization, right? Who made this effort to spread false information, anti-Asian uh, anti um, rhetoric, and supported and aggressively lobbied for laws that would restrict uh, immigration or an increase in the number of uh, people of Asian descent on the West Coast. Right? So in response to their efforts, the General Ulysses S. Webb, the Attorney General for the state of California, began to apply a markedly greater effort to enforcing laws that prohibited Asian ownership of property. So as an example, Asian Indians were driven out of Bellingham, Washington. Bellingham who is right next to Canada, um, was home to 800 um, members um, of the chapter of the Ch Japanese Korean Exclusion League, right? So it's Asiatic Exclusion League, a national labor organization with the, and this is what their mission, quote, to guard the gateway of Occidental civilization, the West Coast, against Oriental invasion, unquote. That's their mission. They had created a platform of five planks and to bring forth to, to the Congress, okay? And these five planks, one, extend the Chinese exclusion laws to exclude Japanese, Koreans, um, and, and Koreans from the United States and its territories, right? So that includes Hawaii, um, Guam, 
um, et cetera. And number two, the members of this league are to play, pledge not to employ or patronize Japanese uh, or Japanese people or to patronize any person um, or for uh, any person or forming uh, employment, employing Japanese or dealing with products that came from such firms. So in other words, you can't, not only can you not employ people, but you also can't buy anything uh, or use any products that came from firms that did, right? So number three was the actions of the school board were to adopt a policy segregating Japanese from white children. And then number four was a campaign calling the attention of the president and Congress to this menace. That's the Oriental invasion. And number five was all labor and civic organizations in the state of California were asked to contribute a fixed assessment to the cause, right? So everyone had to pay a fee to the Asiatic Exclusion League so that they could lobby for these, this platform, right? That's kind of has, you know, some implications today. So then in May, how successful were they, right? In May of 1913, Governor um, Hiram Johnson signed the Webb Haney um, law. So this is commonly recognized as the first alien land law of 1913. These laws limited land leases by quote, aliens ineligible for citizenship. And they also made sure that Asians, especially the Japanese farmers, <laughs> were not eligible for citizenship, right? So Japanese farmer, farmers then purchased or leased land in the name of their US born children to circumvent this restriction because if you were because you know they were you, you were still protected by your birthright citizenship right so later on of course by 1920 more restrictive laws were lobbied for by the AEL and enacted to close that loophole and when it went to vote it passed overwhelmingly at about as a ballot initiative and went into effect in December of 1920 so alien land laws california all loopholes closed by 1920 so after California's success in excluding the Japanese from owning any land, Arizona, Washington State, Louisiana, New Mexico, Idaho, Montana, and Oregon successively passed their own alien land laws prohibiting ownership of land by anyone of Asian descent. And, and furthermore, women who married anyone of Asian descent were also likely to lose their citizenship as well. So if you're a white person, a third generation Irish American, and you married a, um, a person of Chinese or Japanese descent, you could lose your citizenship. So a um, 1917 immigration law defined the geographic zone that excluded, that included India, right? Included India from which no immigrants could come. And that was called the Asiatic barred zone. So in 1923, another court case affirmed that Asian Indians are not white and therefore they are ineligible, for, were ineligible for nationalized citizenship. So the, um, I think that the main immigration act to remember is the Immigration Act of 1924 that denied entry to virtually all Asians, right? So if you think about this, 1924 and the start of World War II, right? the most recent Japanese immigrants must have been living and working in the US for at least 17 years. And for many, this was the majority of their adult life. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my family history because it kind of you know, parallels this a little bit and can um, um, illustrate some of the, this um, kind of turmoil at the time, immediately preceding uh, World War II, during World War II, and then immediately thereafter. Okay, so in my own family, both of my sets of grandparents immigrated from Japan to Hawaii in mm, the early 1900s. Okay, so my mother's family immigrated to Oahu, which was the kind of the business island, right? That's the main island that everybody knows about, but it's not that big. So they came to Hawaii from the Fukushima prefecture. This is a very agricultural region. Most people were farmers. And it was made famous, of course, by the earthquake and tsunami on March the 11th, 2011, that damaged the Daiichi nuclear power plant. Over 15,000 lives were lost and, and um, the tsunami, earthquake and tsunami displaced um, nearly half a million people in 2011. Now, my um, 
which is like a hundred years after my parent, my, my grandparents, um, or my grandfather anyway, immigrated. So my maternal grandparents were farmers in Hawaii and they raised chickens. Now, on the other hand, my father's family immigrated from Kumamoto, which is in Southern Japan, big island. I mean, the, to Pahoa, which is on the big island to work in the sugarcane plantations. But my grandfather was an educator and a community leader. So when he came to Hawaii, he became the principal of the bilingual Japanese language school. Um, furthermore, due to the Japanese, this, there's a Yoshi tradition, right? My paternal grandfather had um, a brother. And this brother was given over because of this tradition to a relative's family in order for him to carry on their family name, right? So this is a tradition. If you don't have any boys, you know, you get to take one from one of your relatives to carry on your family name. So his surname became Nakao, N-A-K-A-O. Um, my great uncle Nakao was big, like me, except he was five foot seven. He attended the Japanese, um, the Imperial Japanese Military Academy and served as a combat engineer in the Imperial Japanese Army, achieving the rank of full bird colonel. That's my, my grandfather's real brother, right? Who is now serving in the Japanese Army. So considering these factors, it's not really that surprising that my grandfather was among the, the first of 2000 community leaders arrested by the FBI in December of 1941 and sent to the U.S. Uh, to ultimately arrived at a U.S. prisoner of war camp in um, Louisiana, Camp Livingstone, Louisiana. While my father, who was his son, right, my father and um, little sister and um, his mother were sent to Camp Jerome in Arkansas for the duration of the war, along with about 800. My dad recalls there were about 800 Japanese, both birthright U.S. citizens, as well as Issei or first generation, who had immigrated to Hawaii. A very small proportion of the 120,000 Japanese immigrants and their U.S. born um, children um, of the total um, population of uh, Japanese Americans who were um, in turn in the um, war relocation authority um, DOJ camps um, during the war. So, but my mom and her family in, on Oahu were considered essential to the economy in Hawaii and they remained in Oahu, although they did have to register as alien registrants. And I, I do have photos of the um, alien registration cards that they were, they were forced to carry. Um, as you all know, in 1941, on December the 7th, which was a Sunday, um, the Japanese planes attacked Pearl Harbor. My mother, turns out, was standing in the yard uh, waiting for a ride to church. And um, she made eye contact. She wrote me that I, I asked her some questions. She wrote them down. Um, she actually made contact with a um, pilot and thought to herself, well, these are not U.S. pilots. And it took, that was like a split second. And the next thing you know, even though they didn't get um, sent to the the camps, um, their lives, uh, lives did change as well. In 1942, Frank, FDR, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, signed the Executive Order 9066. So that is something that I think students should remember, right? The Executive Order 9066 authorized the Secretary of War uh, to delegate military commanders in um, the, the two areas that they, they um, could exclude all persons uh, that were considered to be a threat. Um, from these two military areas. One of the military areas was in Hawaii and the other one was on the West Coast. So, you know, with all of the influence, political influence, et cetera, um, this was enforced against the Japanese Americans. So that's where you saw um, the headlines, right? You know, the Jap invasion and, and um, you know, go home Japs and stuff like that. And they were um, sent to, um, um, you know, staging areas like the Santa Anita racetrack, for example. And other and places like that before they could be sent out to the to the camps. There were ten um, ma major camps um, that that the Japanese Americans from California and Hawaii um, were sent to. Um, for those of you who um, watch Star, let's see, Trek, could be Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, George Takei actually was at Camp Roar, which was thirty miles away from Camp Jerome in Arkansas. So. He can, you can, um, you know, get some, a little bit of history from him as well. But um, 
the camps were basically ready by the spring or the winter of um, um, 1942. And that's when they started resettling um, the Japanese from the West Coast and um, Hawaii um, to the interior of the United States. The, what was shocking to, I think, most people who had voted for um, these exclusion laws, et cetera, was based on misinformation, right? Um, what was shocking to them is the fierce loyalty that the Japanese Americans had um, to this country. And it's not surprising, really, when you think about it, that many of them were actually born here. So they had no allegiance to, the, to Japan and had never been there. Um, but yet, because we, you know, look like this, it seemed like it was easier to make that leap that we must be more loyal to the emperor than to the president. So um, when the when the the first um, in the very beginning of the of the war, um, Japanese who had already volunteered to serve in, for example, the Hawaii Territorial Guard, had volunteered to serve in the military, were quickly stripped of their um, rank and, and, and their um, status, right? And they were considered enemy aliens. Even if they wanted to volunteer, they, they could not. Later, um, the Territorial Guard was shipped off to Camp um, Snelling, Fort Snelling in Minnesota. And um, because many of them were still bilingual, it became obvious that, a, um, that they, would, they may be needed in order to you know, interrogate or um, later, it was found that they could intercept um, communications from um, the Japanese and accurately translate it to let the, um, the U.S. commanders know what was going on in the Pacific. But the great majority um, served in a segregated unit called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and they were united with the 100th uh, Battalion, um, in, uh, which, which the 100th Battalion went over first. Um, but, they, um, but the 442nd was then training at Camp Shelby in Mississippi. This was the first time that the, um, the Japanese from Hawaii, which, you know, we, you know, I always joke because my first language was Pidgin English, um, where, you know, you don't even use, all, you know, the Hawaiian language, for example, you don't even use all the consonants, right? So it's, it's kind of, you know, it takes some getting used to, right? And, um, and the, the Japanese, from the West Coast were fairly sophisticated, uh, many were educated. And, um, and so here they are thrown together at the camp and they had nothing but disdain for one another, right? And, um, but um, Senator Inouye told me many, many stories about his experience as a soldier in, um, in World War um, II from the beginning to the end. And what he said was, um, that they took liberty and they went up to Camp Jerome and Camp Roar because they heard that there were, there were you know, Japanese girls. So there was kind of a, um, a, like a party atmosphere, right? They were gonna go meet Japanese girls before they got shipped off to the war. But when they got there, they saw the barbed wire and they saw the guns pointed towards their families. And here they were, you know, soldiers going off to work. Um, and so he said to me that um, that was very sobering for the um, for the soul, for the four forty second, and that really united them at that time. That before that they'd been rivals, right? But now they they saw what they were um, they were fighting for, right? And just just as the um, segregated um, African American units during World War One, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, all the way throughout history, the um, African-American segregated units were fighting for the freedom that they themselves and their families didn't really enjoy, right? And so, but, but, but this was their country too. And so the, um, they went back and then um, to camp, I mean, to the, you know, to Camp Shelby, and then they were shipped off to Europe. Um, the 442nd, Regimental Combat Team and the 100th Battalion um, distinguished themselves during, um, during World War II in, in the European theater. They became the most decorated unit for the size and duration of conflict. And, um, and their loyalty was not questioned by their white, white leadership. In 1942, after the um, executive order 9066 was um, 
was signed, the camps were opened, the, um, the Japanese Americans were um, relocated, quote unquote, um, the, and the, um, the 442nd began to, uh, or word spread that the, the um, 442nd was um, increasingly successful, although with, um, they took um, kind of a huge hit in terms of, of, of numbers of injuries and deaths. Um, one of the things that Senator Inouye said to me when I first <laughs> um, talked to him at, at length, you know, he said that he always wanted to be a surgeon. So he was actually a pre-med in college. He always wanted to be a surgeon, but he went to the war. And of course, as everyone knows, he lost his arm. And, um, and I said, oh, you know, because we didn't know each other at the time. I said, oh, well, yeah, I'm a surgeon. And he grabs my hand with his hand. He grabs my hands and he goes, you be my hands then or something like that. Made me want to cry. But, but anyway, um, so, you know, things like that make you realize how much people gave up um, in order to defend um, our country and to prove their loyalty um, to the United States. In the, the tradition was, you know, that you sent your daughters back to Japan, you know, to get a husband, well, you know, because they're the land of plenty, as we say. And so uh, my aunt, my dad's sister, was at Tokyo Women's College. And they were she was living in the barracks because my uncle, was, my great uncle, who um, was, you know, on the other side, um, was stationed there. He got orders for Iwo Jima. So he had to leave the barracks. They got on a train and went south to the Kumota, the family home, just as the U.S. planes were, you know, strafing the, uh, the barracks. So they looked back, you know, and saw that that was, um, that was happening and they had just escaped, right? It was my, my great uncle, however, was, was not as lucky. He, um, as my dad said, would have brought great honor to the Izuno family name. <laughs> um, that's my, my um, family name. Um, He's not a family name, but his last name was Nakao, and he was actually killed on Iwo Jima um, um, by the U.S. Marines. So President Truman heard about this, you know, the great um, heroic, um, the heroism of the 442nd and 100th segregated Japanese American Nisei unit. And so he, um, you know, there's kind of a glimmer of hope uh, with the public recognition of the indispensable role the Nisei soldiers played on, in the US um, victory in Europe and, and also the Pacific theater. So on July the 15th, 1946, he affirmed the loyalty and, um, of, the, of the Nisei um, soldiers, soldiers and therefore the Japanese Americans. Um, and we call this the day of affirmation, which we just celebrated um, last weekend. But what Truman said, was you fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you have won. And that is one of, that's kind of been paraphrased a lot of different ways. And often it's, you fought the enemy abroad and prejudice at home, you know, it, it's been paraphrased. But anyway, that's the part most people remember. But the part I remember is the part that says, that followed. He said, keep up the fight and we will continue to win to make this great Republic stand for just what the Constitution says it stands for, the welfare of all the people all the time. So I thought that was, you know, hopeful. And some of the very restrictive laws were rescinded. But it, more recently, there have been some, you know, startling incidents that have occurred that make Truman's charge to us as Americans seem even harder to accomplish. So in, during the Korean War, um, Truman ordered the integration of the US Armed Forces. And in fact, Japanese Americans were drafted just like everyone else. My dad was drafted in uh, 1951 out of college. He actually had a degree, he went to, sent over as an as a, um, enlisted person in military intelligence as an interrogator and interpreter to, to um, Korea. Um, General MacArthur is reported to have refused to integrate the armed forces, so the army um, at the time, and he was relieved by General Matthew Ridgway. So while serving in the theater, you know, remember in 1951, right, the Japanese American soldiers, like my dad, whose birthright citizenship was taken away during World War II, um, his, he, they were all affected by the McCarran Act in 1952, 
that restored their citizenship and also granted the right of naturalization, um, naturalization to other people, persons of um, Japanese um, descent and um, later Asian, uh, to include all, include all Asians. And it wasn't until 1956, which is almost within my lifespan, that California repealed their alien land laws, 1956. So Asian Americans soon became involved in everything, right? Sports, politics, entertainment, um, as well as being accepted into academic programs, leading to undergraduate and graduate degrees. And in fact, during my Navy career, I, um, I actually looked up um, educational attainment um, based on race. And it turns out that um, the Asian American, the Asian, popul Asian American population, 25 years and older, about over 50% of us had um, baccalaureate degrees compared to 33% of the general, um, uh, I mean, of the, of the uh, white population and 11% um, uh, at the time of the African-American population. Uh, Mineta was the mayor of San Jose. You know, there were so many firsts back then. Um, you had the um, election of, um, Senator Inouye uh, from Hawaii when um, Hawaii became a state. But my personal hero is, um, uh, was the, you know, was um, representative, US representative uh, Patsy Takemoto Mink from Hawaii, who co-authored um, Title IX, the Equal Educational Opportunity Act um, that has become so controversial based on, um, and made it, you know, that people have made into all about sports, which it, never was intended to be. It was intended to be equal educational opportunity for girls and women. So, and so when you go through history, right, and you start looking at all these laws that have been enacted and, you know, precedent, right, and, and now we know how important precedent is, um, it really wasn't until 1976 that Gerald Ford, President Ford, rescinded Executive Order 9066. That was 34 years after World War II. It, um, you, you know, basically reversed the, um, the authority to relocate people of different, you know, races uh, by race um, from their homes. And um, then in 1981, of course, there was the Commission on Wartime Relocation and, um, and internment of civilians. So remember, we were, we, the um, Nisei population or Issei and Nisei population um, were civilian, were mostly, you know, civilians, obviously, because we weren't allowed to serve because we were um, um, enemy aliens um, during World War II. So the war relocation, um, this commission, you know, held hearings across the country and, and concludes, and this was significant, right, that the internment was a grave injustice and that the executive order 9066 resulted from racial prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And that's something that, you know, we uh, of um, Japanese descent remember, but something that I think um, everyone should remember, right? Is that, um, is that when you start making laws and you start making, um, you know, justifying exclusion based on race, um, it's, um, it, it's not um, constitutional, right? So I wanna go back to um, that story that I, said earlier about how these Chinese were beaten to death and how nobody was held accountable, right? So fast forward like a hundred years later, in 1982, Vincent Chin, who believe it or not, you know, how many people have heard of him, right? But Vincent Chin, a Chinese American um, draftsman, he was celebrating his engagement was clubbed to death at a bar with a baseball bat by two white auto workers who, according to witnesses, wa were saying, you know, yelling slurs, of course, and saying that because of him, they didn't have jobs, right? Because the Japanese auto workers, you know, the Japanese um, cars were displacing American auto workers in Michigan. Yeah, and so, so they decided to take it out on Vincent Chin, who, by the way, was Chinese and not Japanese. And that was in 1982. And there were many um, discrepancies in how the case was um, was handled. But the bottom line is that they were fine. They there was a minimal fine and no jail time for the two people 
who ended up beating this guy to death. So that was a hundred years after no one was held accountable in, you know, for the, uh, the death of four Chinese uh, people in California. So in 1987, the U.S. House of Representatives voted to make an official apology to Japanese Americans and to pay. And now this is also important when we talk about reparations, right? To pay each surviving internee, right? So I didn't get anything, right? Even though I'm related to a, an internee a generation later, right? This is to pay each surviving internee $20,000. And I remember my dad who we had lived overseas my, you know, my whole life, like in, um, you know, developing countries, because my dad was an international agricultural uh, agronomist, actually. And, um, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy a car. And so we all looked at each other. This was in Asia. like, what kind of car, dad, you know? <laughs> but anyway, um, um, the U.S. Um, House of Representatives voted to make the official apology, right? And in 88, the Senate voted to support redress for uh, the Japanese Americans, and it was the Civil Liberties Act in 1988. But get this, the U.S. House of Representatives vote was 243 to 141, and the U.S. Senate vote was 69 to 17. So for this, I want to know who the dissenters were, like who voted against it, right? Because that does tell you something about, you know, our freedom of thought, right? And I would love to know because um, it's not like the Supreme Court, you know, where you have to actually have a dissenting opinion written, right? But I would love to know what they were thinking, you know, like what, why wouldn't you apologize for something, um, you know, seemingly that egregious, right? But anyway, um, so I'd like to, I, I, I'm just, I mean, I think it's something that we should remember that this was not unanimous, um, that there were many people in, in the Congress and in the Senate, I mean, the House of Representatives and the Senate who disagreed with um, that or, or disagreed that that maybe the 9066 wasn't such a bad idea after all, right? So <clears throat> that they they signed the law, the entitlement program. Uh, finally, in 1989, was signed by um, President Bush one, and um, and the I think the most um, you know other than you know twenty thousand dollars for the people that were in turn. Now that's nice, but what was really great about it is putting it, codifying the preservation of the history of the camps. So now we are allowed to talk about and visit and, um, and see the, not only the, um, the written history, but also get some, um, um, you know, talk to people who know something or see artifacts and, you know, and see where these places are located. I wish I could show you pictures. I, I visited um, Jerome, Arkansas, population 36, by the way, Jerome, Arkansas, population 36, except for when there were the camps. And so, um, um, but that was, um, uh, but that was codified into law too. The preservation of the um, of the sites of the internment camps um, for you know for historical purposes. So that's um, um, now when you, I mean, that's kind of the history of of um, the Japanese Americans. My own history paralyzed, parallels it in some somewhat. Um, and you know, if it were not for the the four the four forty second and how they distinguish themselves as um, as Terry Shima who is um, by the way a national treasure he is a World War II veteran of the four forty second who lives right up here in Gaithersburg Maryland and um, has been very active in um, digitizing the at the National Archives some of the historical artifacts from the um, uh, World War II and the Nisei experience um, during uh, during the war uh, both those who were deployed and those who remain behind. The, he used to always say that, um, you know, we went from, you know, alien, enemy aliens, you know, they didn't want us in the military. And in my generation or in my lifetime, we got a four-star general, right? Eric Shinseki, who also was the secretary of the Veterans, um, Veterans Affairs, a um, Japanese American from, uh, I think he was from Kauai. Um, who made it all the way up to a four-star general. And even more significant, Senator Inouye was um, elected by his peers in the Senate, President Pro Tem of the Senate. So he was third in line for the presidency, a Japanese American who was initially considered an enemy alien unfit to serve. And so because of them, 
I was able to make that choice because of Patsy Mink. I was able to go to college. I was able to get commissioned. I was able to go to uh, medical school. And, um, and while my career was not nearly as distinguished as, as theirs, I served for 35 years. I did achieve the rank of 06. And in fact, when they received the medal, gold medal, the congressional gold medal, the 442nd, I attended that and I, I called my daughter. I said, you have to come down here. I was a volunteer and, um, and talk to these um, amazing people. And, um, and I met, I was standing around in my uniform uh, with my four gold stripes because I'm a Navy captain. And this man with a blue, light blue ribbon around his neck and a medal, that would be a medal of honor, grabs my hands and he has tears in his eyes. And he says, I never thought in my lifetime I would ever see a Japanese female 06. And I was like, I really didn't do anything, sir, <laughs> you know, compared to you. Um, but it's, um, um, it, there has been so much progress made and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely indebted to all of the sacrifices that have previously been made um, so that, you know, people like me can be successful in whatever I choose, choose to do. So I would like to leave you with one, a little sobering thought. So fast forward to current events, right? Current events include COVID. And we thought we were under the radar, right? Asian Americans, you know, were kind of forgotten. Yeah, you know, now we wish we were forgotten, right? But now we've been thrust into the limelight, the origins of COVID in China, um, misinformation, does that sound familiar? Um, spread widely, virulently, and leads to an upwards of 400% 400, increase in documented crimes um, directed towards Asians. And, you know, I opened my, my um, remarks by saying, you know, we really didn't want to be in the spotlight. But even so, you know, we can't forget that the Sikhs were targeted in 1907 and 1905, you know, and again, you know, what's happened in Wisconsin and in, um, um, at the FedEx building, you know, in Indiana, it, it's, you know, there seems to be, you know, kind of a cyclic repeating of history. And um, that is one of one cycle. I would, I would love to see that, you know, if, if we could just break that cycle, that would be, um, that would, I think, be what I feel would be, uh, would be success. So I, I know I've babbled on for, <laughs> for a while, but um, I'm just fascinated by this kind of history. I hope you and, and you know, your students and others are similarly um, become more fascinated as you read more and more about it. Um, and I'd be happy you know, to take any questions um, at this point.